uh, God, I said God is sovereign over the world, which means, of course, then that the nations of the world uh, belong to God. That's a very strange thing to hear, I imagine. But the founding of a nation, of any nation, even if its origins arise out of conflict and struggle, the founding of a nation is, comes from a dream, a dream that someone had about what a nation could be. And throughout that nation's history, any nation, through its, throughout its sins, its failures, its weaknesses, its challenges, the dream of what the nation wants to be or should be or can be remains firmly etched in that nation's destiny, even if the nation forgets the dream in which it was conceived. The United States is a nation conceived in a dream, uh, a dream that saw what this nation wants to be or, or should be or can be, lofty aspirations of freedom, justice, and, and equality as inalienable gifts of God to all of humanity. Wow, that's some dream. And yet, in spite of that dream, what has prevailed so remarkably and so consistently is the nightmare of genocide, of slavery, of disfranchisement of women and African Americans, of segregation and discrimination, of internment of Americans, of refusal of asylum to refugees, of poverty. Yes, a nation conceived in a dream fell into a nightmare. Unfortunately, in light of this nightmare, we have convinced ourselves that the mere fact of the dream is enough. We mean well. We dream well. That's long as we pay lip service to freedom, justice, and equality, we can be forgiven for the nightmare of injustice. As long as we say the words freedom, justice, we can be forgiven for the nightmare of inequality. But here's the question of every nation. Here's the question of this nation. Can a nation be great? Can America ever be great? Can she ever be what she is intended to be if she does not live true to the dream in which she was conceived? And what are the people of God and the community of faith to do when a nation so conceived, conceived in freedom, justice, and equality for all of humanity, what are the people of faith to say to that nation when it falls victim to the nightmare of an empire turned away from God? Israel faced a similar reckoning of all nations. Conceived in a dream, it was, but it faced a similar reckoning as Babylon, a more powerful empire, menaced and threatened Israel. And the prophet Jeremiah faced a similar question we face in having to speak into a context of a nation in which a nightmare prevails over God's dream for God's people. Even before Jeremiah was born, God chose him and gave him a word to speak to the nations and to the kingdoms, to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. You see, even God knew that the dream that was Israel would be threatened by the nightmare of empire. God knew it. So Jeremiah has a role to play in how God's politics and God's government is to prevail in the world. Okay, see, now I'm about to get in trouble. I said God's politics and God's government. That's strange language. Even for me, by the way, that's strange language. You see, God chose a people with whom to be in covenant and who would become a nation. It was God's dream 
that Israel would be a blessing to the world. That's what God told Abraham. I will make a blessing out of you. And this dream, this relationship, this connection between God and God's people is confirmed with the call to love God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbor. This relationship, it was, it was etched in the commandments that set out what Israel must do to honor the covenant and live in their identity as God's people. They were living God's dream. Living God's dream. However, I love, I love the way some scholars said, Israel become, became unreliable, unresponsive, and disobedient. Unreliable, unresponsive, and disobedient. Israel had become so enraptured of God's willingness to plant and to build, they forgot that God's sovereignty over the world and the nations also included the power to pluck up and pull down, to destroy and to overthrow. You see, God is not going to allow God's dream for the world to last as a nightmare. God is going to judge. So Jeremiah was appointed by God to remind Israel to speak the governing word of God over against Israel's royal consciousness and self-deception. Israel needed to hear the governing word of God because she had become so convinced of her blessedness and her relationship with God that she started to skimp on living God's dream for herself and for the world. Oh, let me put it this way. See, Israel knew how to praise God. You went to worship like, boy, those people can worship. Israel knew how to practice worship. They knew the words to say. They, they celebrated the blessings God bestowed. Oh, they had church down. But they missed the justice part. They, they could sing like birds. But they missed the part about serving and helping the weak. See how quiet you all are? They knew, they knew how to pray and pray well. It was lofty, it was beautiful, but they forgot the part about not hurting their neighbor. And they had come to believe that because God is loyal and because God's promises are sure, surely God will never allow anything to happen to us. Surely God will never allow Babylon to breach the corners of this land. Surely God is going to protect us even though we forgot to do justice. We forgot to serve the weak. We forgot to do what is right. Life is so good and so prosperous that they move away from God's dream of what they want it to be, should be, or can be, and the nightmare began. They stopped loving and protecting their neighbors. They stopped protecting the stranger, the foreigner, the orphan, the widow. They began to be violent with one another. They just did not do justice. They started to look the other way or rationalize or even justify theft, murder, adultery, lying, and idol worship, as long as it meant that they can maintain their position of blessedness. So even when they disobeyed and disappointed God, they could always run back to the house of God and say, we are saved. We're in with God. We're in. And here's how God knew and God checked that, that, that understanding. God sent Jeremiah to prophesy God's intent to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow and restore the dream. But here's what you got to notice something. Notice something. God didn't send Jeremiah to the king's palace to speak God's governing word. Uh-oh. God didn't send Jeremiah to the wealthy developers and the, the rich financiers to tell about God's governing word. God didn't send Jeremiah to the 
Palestinian news network to sit on the panel and discuss how the nations can come back. God sent Jeremiah to the church. See how quiet you all are? I knew it was going to be upset. I'm, I get it. God didn't send Jeremiah out there to talk to them. God sent Jeremiah in here to talk to us. When the dream became a nightmare, God didn't send Jeremiah to tell the king, you better get right. God sent Jeremiah to the temple to tell the faithful folk, you better get right. God didn't send Jeremiah out there. God sent Jeremiah in here to the temple, to the place of worship, to the people who claim to love and serve God. Jeremiah was appointed over nations and kingdoms, but God sent Jeremiah to the temple to stand at the gates set aside for God's people. And the message was clear. Turn back to God. Amend your ways. Live the dream in which you were conceived. Don't think that just because you come here to worship, just because you know the right prayers and song, just because you claim God, that you are safe. Because if you do that, you have turned God's house of prayer into a den of robbers. And so that leaves us with the question, what has become of Jesus' dream for our church? I'm not just talking about all God's children, I'm talking about the church universal. What has become of Jesus' dream for the church? Jesus came fulfilling the greatest commandment to love God and to love neighbor. And the church of Jesus Christ was conceived in the preaching of the good news to the poor. Recovered sight for the blind, liberation for the oppressed, food for the hungry, drink for the thirsty, healing for the sick, visitings for the prison, clothing for the naked. It was conceived in that kind of behavior. What has become of Jesus' dream for the church? It has become a nightmare. I don't mind saying it. Pastor, how can you say it's become a nightmare? Because there are any number of people, any number of people, when life has thrown them a, 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 a challenge, when they don't know where to go or where to turn, where it is becoming so hard to live and, and everything on all sides is weighing down on them, the last place they want to go to is church. The last place they want to come is the church. The church has become a nightmare. The church has given aid and, and comfort to the nation's imperial aims, covering for injustice and violence and destruction committed in our names. The church has stopped prophesying God's governing word and has signed on to become Democrats and Republicans, nationalists and independents, socialists and capitalists, and God's governing word has been lost. The church is mired in an attitude that holds that as long as we go to church, as long as we praise and worship God, we can hate people of other races. As long as I believe that this is the literal word of God, I can, I can reject whomever I want. I'm safe. I'm safe. As long as I know the right songs and the right prayers, I can treat immigrants as threats and criminals and deport them recklessly. I can reject God's LGBTQ people and even try to convert them with this dangerous conversion therapy. I can do whatever I want because I'm saved. That's what the church has done. I, I see people saying, as long as I can pray and I can, I can sing like Peter and preach like Paul, I can refuse to protect and serve the sick, the hungry, and the prisoner because they don't deserve it. Oh, I know you've heard it. Oh, they don't deserve it. The dream of the church has turned into a nightmare. 
God's promises and dream for the church are secure. They are real. But that's why God's governing word through Jeremiah, God's governing word through Jesus comes not just to the nations, it comes to us. If we, the church, would amend our ways and our doings, if we, the church, would stop oppressing the weak, the poor, the vulnerable, and the exploited and the left out, if we, the church, would stop shedding innocent blood and stop worshiping our wealth, our homes, and our stuff, then God will be pleased to dwell with us. And that's the beauty of this prophecy. If it sounded horrible to you, let me tell you the beautiful, the beauty of the prophecy. The beauty of the prophecy, which is hard to hear and even harder to abide, is that God wants to dwell with us. We are the dream. We are God's dream. A community gathered here to love and serve. We are God's dream. That's what that prophecy wants to remind us. God wants the house of God to be a house of prayer for the nations. Not just for the people who look like us or worship like us. God's dream is that we would love God with all our heart, mind, and soul, and strength, and love our neighbors as ourselves. That's the dream. And here's another thing. God has not given up on the dream and God has not given up on us to live it. That's the beauty here. It's not all pretty what what Jeremiah has to do, but the beauty is the reason Jeremiah has to do it, the reason Jesus has to do it is because God wants that dream alive. And we are it. Oh, that's right, imperfect, messy us. We're a dream, God's dream. That's right, us. We get it wrong so much. Girl, we mess it up all the time. But we are it. And God is pleased to dwell among us and with us to do it. And so we have a chance to let that dream prevail. We do, it is us, it's on, we're a part of something beautiful and grand and powerful. And it's not to protect us from anything, but it's for us to co-create and work with God to make it a reality for all those others who are screaming, screaming for community. Yes, we're in the midst of dreams and nightmares. But remember, we are the dream of God. Let us make it so. Amen.